Hello, everybody. This is Dominique Gomez from the Salazar Center at Colorado State University. Thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar about working lands and the part they play in large landscape conservation. We have three great panelists to talk with us today, and I'm very excited to introduce, to that, introduce them to you in just one minute. Uh, first, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, first of all, all attendees are on mute, so we can't hear you, but we definitely want to hear your questions. So you can submit your questions and comments through that GoToWebinar control panel question box uh, on the, the lower half of the control panel there. You can submit questions throughout today, and we will get to just as many as we possibly can towards the end of the session. The session is being recorded, and we will share it just as soon as we can, so you can send the link and watch it with your colleagues and friends uh, in, the, in the coming weeks. You can learn more about the Salazar Center at salazarcenter.colostate.edu, and you can follow us on Twitter or LinkedIn or Facebook. The CSU Salazar Center for North American Conservation works to support and advance the health and connectivity of natural systems and landscapes throughout North America. We know that healthy natural systems support climate adaptation and resilience, protect biodiversity, and support long-term human health. And we take an intersectional approach that builds bridges to connect academic research, community practice, and policy development. And this webinar is part of our Connecting for Conservation webinar series. We've been bringing uh, all sorts of different topics to you over the course of the year, everything from climate adaptation, indigenous knowledge, biodiversity, cross-border work, and you can view all of our past webinars as well as be notified about future webinars on our website, again, salazarcenter.colostate.edu. Today, we are very excited to talk about working lands and the role that they play in large landscape conservation. This is a little bit of a follow-on to a webinar that we had a few weeks ago about large landscape conservation movements, such as 30 by 30 and Half Earth. Um, and in that session, in which we had the chief scientist at WWF, Dr. Rebecca Shaw, and Heath Nero from the WEAST campaign talk a little bit about those uh, efforts, we talked uh, about how in order to really achieve something like a, uh, conserving 30% of our land by 2030 or half the Earth, we will need to think differently about conservation. And uh, Dr. Rebecca Shaw talked a little bit about other effective area-based conservation and the idea that we need to move beyond the idea that conservation means pristine land, uh, it means setting aside protected areas, and that we need to really look at working lands and other defined spaces that are not necessarily protected, but are governed and managed over the long term in ways that deliver effective and enduring biodiversity, ecosystem services, and other cultural values. We're so excited to have three great panelists share a little bit of their work and their knowledge with us today. With that, I am very honored to introduce our first panelist, Leslie Allison, who is the Executive Director of the Western Landowners Alliance. Leslie is a founding member and Executive Director. She is also a founding member of the Chama Peak Land Alliance. And for the past three decades, Leslie has worked extensively with private landowners and multiple stakeholders to advance conservation, sustain working lands, and support rural communities. Prior to the Western Landowners Alliance, Leslie managed a large ranch in the southern San Juan Mountains of Colorado. Leslie holds a BA from Columbia University and an MA from St. John's College in Santa Fe. Leslie, thank you so much uh, for, for joining us today. Oops, Leslie, we can't hear you. Let's see here. Let's see. Just one second here. We're having some technical difficulties. Hmm. Leslie, it doesn't seem like we're hearing you. Um, maybe we can have you call in on your phone. And Rye, I'm going to put you on the spot. Maybe we can hear from you. I'll introduce you in just a second. And then while, uh, while you're speaking, Leslie, we'll make sure that we can uh, 
make sure you're heard for your presentation. So with that, we'll actually go to our second panelist, Rye Austin, and then we'll come back to, to hear from Leslie. Sorry about that here. Um, Rye, let me introduce you. Rye is the executive director of the Malone Family Land Preservation Foundation. He grew up in Colorado and has a passion for the outdoors. Oops, let's see here. Um, and he's the, the I'm sorry, the Malone Family Land Preservation Foundation protects the agricultural heritage and natural beauty of properties across the United States. He is an executive board member of the Denver Area Council of the Boy Scouts of America, and he holds a BA in economics from the University of Colorado at Boulder and an MS in real estate from the University of Denver. His interests include hunting, fly fishing, bicycling, and telemark skiing. Rye, are you there? Can you hear from you? I am here. Can you hear me? Wonderful. Yes, and we can see you. Good. Great. Thank and you so much for stepping in. Bio. Um, I'm no longer uh, on the board of the Boy Scouts. I now am a trustee of the National Western Stock Show. Uh, sit on the board of Colorado Cattlemen's Agricultural Land Trust. And uh, other than that, it was it was fairly accurate in terms of my interests and passions. Uh, but um, so I am the executive director of the Malone Family Land Preservation Foundation. Uh, we focus uh, throughout the United States. We hold property in Canada. And really, in, our, uh, in its simplest form, our mission is to preserve land in its natural state for the benefit of the public and surrounding environment. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't operate our land. In fact, uh, we feel very strongly that responsible management uh, provides responsible land management and operations provide the best conservation outcomes when you consider examples like sustainable grazing replacing the benefits of the soil and native vegetation that were provided by bison and elk historically and the benefits that sustainable timber harvesting provides to the health of the forest uh, our activities include the research implementation and sharing of sustainable land management practices we conduct quite a few of those and develop those practices on our own um, we like to, when we work with landowners and we feel that we've achieved some successes, we'd like to bring those successes to landowners and rather than telling them what to do on their properties and with their land, we like to uh, provide information as to what we've done and what our successes have done been, and allow them to make their own decisions. Uh, we conduct those activities on land owned by the foundation. Uh, we hold uh, land in Lawrence, Kansas that we use within our perennial agriculture project. Uh, that's in conjunction with the Land Institute out of, that's out of Salina, Kansas, um, on our ranches in Kiowa, Colorado, on the Red Top Ranch in Southeast Colorado, and on the Foundation's Island property in Western Canada. Um, we also work to accomplish our goals through joint projects with groups like the Land Institute, the Conservation Fund, and other nonprofit groups. Uh, really, one of the most important facts that we recognize is the role that economic viability of local communities plays in long-term conservation. Without people to help manage our properties, we really can't succeed. So we try to provide support in the forms of employment through uh, management opportunities on our ranches, uh, some community support. Uh, an example of that is that we've established a community center within Saratoga, Wyoming, where there are youth programs, where there are yoga programs for seniors, uh, and really provide access to a space that allows the community of Saratoga to come together, improve their health and welfare. Um, and then uh, on top of that, we try to maintain agricultural values. Uh, we're seeing a major issue within this part of the country of, of flight from rural areas because young people are finding greater opportunities outside of their communities and outside of agriculture. Uh, and we're trying to uh, provide additional opportunities for young people within those communities. Um, all of those approaches, everything that we do, tends to require innovation. And that innovation comes with risk. We feel that assuming risk from individuals and other organizations is an essential element to the conservation outcomes that we're seeking. We're in a position where we can take on those risks uh, as an organization that other organizations might not be able to take on and that some individuals can't take on because if uh, they, they apply new practices and the outcome isn't positive, they might have to worry about putting food on the table and, and, and effectively lose a year of, uh, of production. So we put ourselves in a position to, to take on those risks um, 
And we're also in a position where if we generate positive results, we can share those outcomes with operators uh, and, and try to uh, generate sustainable activities and management practices on a broader scale. One, op, uh, one example of this uh, in terms of partnership with another group is that we're working through uh, what we refer to as the Perennial Agriculture Project with the Land Institute out of Salina. Uh, they have been around for decades uh, and have been developing perennial agriculture practices, uh, primarily uh, the kerns of wheat and sorghum, as well as other uh, seeds for oils and the like. Uh, benefits of the crops include greater uh, greater soil health because uh, there's less soil disturbance, so the biome remains intact. Drought resistance because you wind up with incredibly deep root structures on some of these uh, crops because they, they reoccur year after year. Uh, reduced need for fertilizer, again, because of that root structure, which leads to, to less nitrogen pollution. Uh, and reduced tillage and soil disturbance because, again, these are perennial crops. Uh, and tillage and soil disturbance are the number two source of carbon emissions. They were previously faced with a situation where they were effectively surviving year to year um, in their uh, research funds. We entered a 15-year joint project with them to allow them to, to tackle these long-term problems with long-term funding. So effectively, we alleviated that risk that they faced from a funding standpoint and really allowed them to focus on what they do best. Uh, since uh, the inception of the perennial agriculture project, which again, we are uh, a key part of um, and have really worked with them to focus their efforts on, on their research uh, and uh, hiring new fellows and uh, working with, with different research uh, groups globally. Uh, the, uh, the Land Institute has been able to uh, work with different groups such as General Mills and Patagonia Provisions to get kerns of wheat into uh, into products uh, that previously uh, didn't include uh, kerns as an ingredient, and really to to uh, push the use of these perennial crops um, for long term benefit, effectively of mankind. And all credit in that goes to the Land Institute. We participated, we helped, we were right alongside them, but they're an incredible group. Uh, another example of risk taping, taking was a program that uh, we implemented on uh, the foundation 75,000 acre red top ranch which is in southeast colorado in that project we brought together some strange bed fellows uh, we worked with the nature conservancy and colorado cattlemen's association to create a program that would contribute to keeping the price of ranch land in colorado at values that are support supportable by agricultural operations as anybody who lives in this state knows uh, land values have uh, been on an upward trend for decades and in many areas, even largely agricultural areas, it can be a struggle to find properties that uh, pencil uh, from a ranching standpoint. The idea in that case was that we would bring our land uh, to the table. We would sell it at a bargain sale uh, to an uh, at, at agricultural value uh, to a qualified nonprofit. Um, if we were a private group, um, and we were viewing this as a estate planning method, uh, we would have received a, a tax deduction based on the difference between the sale price and market value. And then that nonprofit would identify a group of seasoned and beginning ranchers to operate the property together with the seasoned operator providing mentorship to the, young, to the uh, younger generation of ranchers. Um, they'd be able to uh, purchase property from the nonprofit of ag value and the nonprofit would maintain an interest in the property equivalent to the difference between market and ag value and could ensure the property stay in the program and open over the long term we took this risk with our land we were willing to to effectively establish this new program in this case it didn't work out we went through an rfp program uh, we had interested parties it didn't get done but this is an example where we were able to take a risk uh, we didn't complete the program, but it's still a viable option going forward for other landowners and has created a new avenue for land conservation and for agriculture to continue into the future in this region. Um, so we feel that, you know, even though it could be construed as a failure, it, it, it really was a success over the long term. Um, as you'll hear from Leslie and Eric, there is no question that, that uh, operating lands over the, over the long haul are going to be 
absolutely in, essential to public land or to private land converse, uh, conservation. Um, the government does a, a wonderful job of conserving uh, open spaces. We're blessed in this country to have the public lands that we have access to, but without the cooperation work of uh, private individuals holding private lands, we'll never achieve our long-term goals. And operating lands provide one of the best outcomes and uh, best avenues uh, for those landowners to continue to keep their properties open, protect wildlife habitat, protect watersheds and otherwise. So. With that, I will turn it over to Leslie if, if we can hear her. Hello, can you hear me this time? Hello, can you hear me? Thank you, Leslie, right. wonderful. Okay. Thank great. you so much and for that, Rye and Leslie, we'll go back to your slides. Sorry about that earlier audio, but I think that uh, Rye's comments and particularly some of those interesting projects that they're able to take that, that are a little more risky are, are great models and um, there will be lots of great discussion. Uh, with that, uh, Leslie, thank you again. Um, Leslie is the Executive Director of Western Landowners Alliance and we are so excited to have you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, and thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, it's fun to be here with Ryan and Eric. Um, so we can predict with some certainty, actually, that the future of conservation will focus on working lands. What I hope to leave you guys with today is the appreciation that the conservation of working lands is both critically important and also fundamentally different than the preservation of wild places. Working lands are those portions of the landscape from which we as humans derive our sustenance. They're the lands that we actively manage to meet our own needs as a species. And people chose to settle these particular lands for the same reason that wildlife depends so heavily on them. They're in, the most, they're in most cases the most habitable and biologically diverse and well-watered portions of the landscape. If you really want to experience a lot of wildlife, go to a well-managed ranch. Because they form the cornerstones for both human communities and ecosystems, the conservation and stewardship of these lands is obviously vitally important. But the approach to conserving working lands must be fundamentally different than traditional preservation strategies. And this is really what I want to emphasize. When we designate wilderness, for instance, we're segregating or effectively partitioning people from a wild place. And this can be done by drawing a line on a map legislating and enforcing, and often this has been done from afar. But in the case of working lands, it's almost exactly the opposite, because here we need to integrate people and natural systems. Land managers face a tremendous challenge in trying to support multiple interests and values from production to conservation, and it's a constant juggling act requiring trade-offs, ongoing negotiation, and adaptive management. This is very context specific, and it's not something that can be governed from afar. This is why we're seeing community-based collaboratives emerge as a kind of organic solution. These collaboratives allow for the next necessary flexibility and the adaptive management we need, and have proven effective in many landscapes. And I would point you to the Blackfoot Challenge and the Malpai Borderlands Group as just a couple of many examples. So this is very different than the blanket management prescriptions that have characterized much of our conservation work to date. And when it comes to working lands conservation, the economics really matter. In our current economic system, land is a financial asset, and in many cases, the foundation for a land-based business. At the end of the day, as with any business, more money has to come in than goes out. And until we better align economics with ecological stewardship, natural lands and the biodiversity they support will continue to decline. Economics also matters very importantly for the sake of equity. Unless working lands can sustain reasonable livelihoods, only the wealthy will be able to afford land. In addition, many in the rural landscape have come to perceive conservation as a kind of environmental or recreational colonialism driven by urban interests. Most of us who live in a city or a suburb have not paid the costs of our impacts to wildlife and the environment. Our houses, office buildings, highways, energy fields, and recreational activities have displaced wildlife. Our weekend drives to the mountains 
lakes and ski hills, our air travel, our endless consumption have all but obliterated the values that we say we seek to conserve. Yet we are not holding ourselves accountable for driving wildlife off the land. Most of us pay less than the cost of a six pack in federal taxes each year to conserve threatened and endangered species. And now we look out at the rancher or farmer who has managed to keep the land open and ask that they take the moral and financial responsibility for conserving what's left. The public will pay for a house, for oil and gas, and to a certain price point for beef, but far less so for the habitat needed for an endangered snail or frog, for winter forage, for deer and elk, or to help reduce the livestock um, and wildlife conflicts. So we get what we pay for. If we're to be serious about conserving these essential lands, we must invest in them. And not just in conservation easements, not just in cost share programs, though both of those are very important, but in creating the economic conditions and positive human relationships needed to support conservation and stewardship long term. And regulatory approaches, while necessary to a certain level, only go so far. You can legally prevent a person from killing an animal, but you can't force that person to create or enhance its habitat. A land manager makes a thousand decisions a year that impact various conservation values, and only a tiny fragment of those fall within any regulatory reach. Whether that individual experiences conservation as a net positive or negative will affect the 999 other decisions they make about land use and land management. And what about the idea of rewilding working lands? There are without question ecological benefits in some places of returning land to a wild condition. And there are other cases in which such a return is more like an abandonment, diminishing ecological values that had previously been nurtured and supported by people. There are places where irrigation provides the only available water and habitat for certain wildlife, for example. And well-managed livestock grazing has proven an important tool in sustaining native grasslands that co-evolved with grazing animals. For some people, the idea of converting working lands into national parks or other public recreation areas is attractive and seems to pose an economic solution in the form of ecotourism. Yet outdoor recreation is not the same as conservation. In many cases, it is the opposite. The Colorado State University study in 2016 highlighted the industrial scale impacts of outdoor recreation on the environment. And the crowded highways and booming development in and around our national parks underscore this point. But more importantly, working lands serve two essential functions. They supply our basic needs from food and fiber to energy and minerals. And they form the transition between the urban and the wild, the place where people and nature intersect. This is an incredibly important space and the only real place where as human beings we can work out our relationship with the natural world, where we can and must learn how to occupy the planet without destroying it. The good news is that given the right resources and support, people, just like pollinators and beavers, have the capacity to enrich the living community of the land. The other good news is that landowners and managers across the country are already doing tremendous work in conserving and restoring habitat, streams and watersheds, continuously learning how to improve soil health and building collaborative partnerships. These stories don't end up very often in the media and generally take place out of the public eye, but some of the very best conservation today is taking place on working lands. The right kinds of approaches and support can go a very long way towards sustaining and restoring both biodiversity and human well being including human health. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leslie. That was just a great introduction to the, the role of working lands and so much to unpack, um, so much great research and some great ideas. I see some questions coming in from the audience. A reminder to everyone else that you can submit your questions on the GoToWebinar control panel there on your right-hand side. Um, and with that, we are going to get to our final panelist, uh, Eric Glenn. I'm so excited to introduce Eric to you. He is the executive director of the Colorado Cattlemen's Agricultural Land Trust 
As executive director, he oversees the operations of the land trust and works closely with the board of directors and staff to ensure that there is consistent alignment with the mission and strategic plan. Eric has facilitated more than 60 conservation easement transactions since 2008 and secured more than $10 million in grants for the purchase of conservation easements throughout the state of Colorado. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Natural Resources Management from Colorado State University and a Master of Resource Law Studies from the University of Denver and an Executive MBA from the Daniel Colleges, Daniels College of Business at the University of Denver. Eric, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Dominique. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you great. Great. Um, thanks to the Salazar Center for putting on this uh, session today as well. And, and thanks to my co-panelists, Rye and Leslie, who are great partners uh, in private land conservation. And uh, as we were talking before the session began, uh, how small this community really is, not just in the state, but regionally and, and even nationally. And, and so it's an honor to be with them and with all of you today uh, for this important conversation. So I wanna start, uh, and I think it's a good segue from Leslie's uh, presentation uh, with a little brief background on Colorado Cattlemen's Ag Land Trust, because I think it's important background information and contextual information for attendees in relation to how private working lands conservation has uh, evolved uh, over time. Uh, and, and it's a, I think the working lands component of conservation uh, is one that hasn't been emphasized uh, enough uh, historically and one that's really going to play a critical role uh, in in scale and connectivity and achieving the goals uh, for conservation moving forward. So in, in 1995, the membership of the Colorado Cattlemen's Association, which is the oldest uh, trade association in the livestock uh, and agriculture world, uh, created uh, a land trust. And they created a land trust because they had members that were demanding uh, to have a conservation organization that understood production agriculture. It had never been done uh, at this level before and uh, nobody really knew how successful it would be. Uh, but what is astounding to those that were here when this organization began is, is the success uh, and the slides uh, uh, the slide below really talks about the success of 640,000 acres across Colorado being conserved since 1995, which is an incredible number, uh, particularly when you understand that we don't solicit conservation. Uh, conservation uh, within this land trust really comes from uh, the, the grassroots. It comes from the landowners uh, driving uh, that conservation. Our goal was to ensure that uh, as an organization is to ensure that we maintain a scale of land where agriculture can be viable in the future. By doing that, we also protect habitat, water resources, open space, and other conservation values. But what's really important to understand in the context of working lands conservation is uh, that stemming out of the creation of Colorado Cattlemen's Ag Land Trust is seven other ag-based land trusts across the West uh, that now make up what's known as the Partnership of Rangeland Trusts. And those organizations have collectively conserved almost three million acres across the West, uh, which now you start talking about scale. And, and it's my belief that those organizations in partnership with many other uh, conservation groups like the Nature Conservancy, the Trust for Public Land, the Conservation Fund, Leslie's group, the Western Landowners Alliance will lead the major effort to create conservation at scale uh, that we need to achieve some of those conservation goals that people have outlined. Um, Dominique, if you can advance the slide, that'd be great. And, and, and the next slide here uh, kind of shows, and I included it to show how scale and connectivity can begin to develop using different methods uh, of looking at conservation. As I had mentioned, we don't solicit conservation. 
uh, conservation comes and is driven by the landowners themselves. And the red on this map shows the uh, conservation that, that we have done uh, since 1995. And you can see pockets of connectivity uh, in pockets of scale just developing uh, organically uh, within those communities. And, and that's something that I think for us in conservation, we need to be thinking about is how, how do you drive conservation moving forward? How do we create out of the box strategies uh, to achieve the kind of scale we're working for? Next slide. But there are significant challenges in my mind to getting to that scale. And Leslie talked about some of those uh, in her presentation, but I really want to focus on uh, on kind of you could lump some of these together, but I've I've individually kind of listed them here on the on the slide of what I would argue are the four most pressing challenges to to getting to scale. Um, and I didn't put funding on here because I think funding falls uh, within the valuation piece, but um, private lands play the critical role when we're thinking about connectivity and creating scale. And as I said, I think they've not historically been emphasized enough in the conservation arena the same way that public lands have been. And I think that's changing and that's, that's a good thing. But these challenges that we face are, are where do we place emphasis in terms of valuing conservation? In the conservation easement world where I work, the, the value is largely placed on uh, a, a hypothetical loss of development. It's not on what we're actually trying to achieve in terms of conservation. It's on terms of what are we eliminating, which I think creates a number of problems in the public policy arena, but it also creates problems in, in continuing to advance conservation in the future. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. It's also a reliance on conservation products and tools that were developed decades ago and really haven't innovated over time. And we need innovation. We're starting to see some innovation with ecosystem service markets being developed, uh, but we need more of that. And we need to look at existing tools like conservation easements. How can we innovate those uh, to make them work better uh, to advance uh, conservation uh, in the future. And then somewhat connected to that is what I believe is, is somewhat of a sense of complacency within conservation that these tools that we've had in many instances for years and years are gonna continue to carry us forward and we really don't need to necessarily think differently. And again, I think this is a historical challenge. I think I've seen changes in this uh, in the last five years. But I think we need to address and recognize uh, that to some degree, all of our organizations, uh, including mine, uh, have been complacent over time. And, and we need to consistently drive how to, the, uh, a process of questioning how do we do better. And, and that's really what I mean by uh, overcoming complacency continuing to have conversations each and every day about how we can how we can modify, how we can innovate to do better, uh, to achieve more. Next slide. And so what do I see as the opportunities to, to overcome uh, these challenges, to innovate, to get us to scale? Uh, and, and where I see the opportunities are the we need to shift the value proposition. We need to look at alternative ways to value conservation based on the actual conservation that we're doing. And some of the ecosystem services markets are looking at that uh, proposition, but we need to do that across all of the tools we have. I'd also argue that we need to think as a population uh, and within our policymakers about how we value uh, and, and we promote the value of conservation to, uh, to the citizens. We also need to continue to develop these new tools like ecosystem service markets. But in my opinion, uh, that for those markets to work, we really need to combine science with sociological elements uh, when developing those tools and protocols that govern them, uh, because we need to think about, uh, and, I'll, and I'll give you a specific example. So in the carbon space, uh, there's this uh, element of uh, concept of additionality, which makes 
absolute sense from a scientific standpoint, but if not applied correctly, could, could potentially harm uh, the market development, in my opinion, because you're uh, excluding some producers from participating in that market potentially in the future uh, for doing the right thing 20 years ago. And I think if we don't think about the sociological elements of these uh, markets as they're developing and the tools, uh, we may inhibit the the, adaptation, the adoption of those markets and those tools moving forward. And then we need to continue to develop new tools or innovate these existing tools to tackle our problems of today, because conservation problems of today look very different than they did 20, 30 years ago. To some degree, they look very different than they did five years ago. And for instance, I think we really need to have an honest discussion about looking at 10-year, 30-year term conservation products to tackle uh, the land conservation uh, or land conversion issues that we're seeing. Uh, and I essentially, at the end of the day, I think we need to be talking to the customer who is the landowner. How do we develop products that take their needs, goals, and objectives into consideration. I have yet to meet a landowner uh, who is not open to conservation um, at some level, and they all do conservation because conservation is critical to how they run their business. But when we start talking about the existing conservation tools like a perpetual conservation easements, there are producers that aren't interested in that because of the perpetuity element. So can we look at other tools uh, that can also ensure that we have these lands for the future, uh, but that look different from a perpetual conservation easement? And I think the answer to that is yes, we just need to be creative. And so with that, Dominique, I'll turn it back over to you and we can get into the Q&A. Thank you so much, Eric. That was a, a great addition to what Rye and Leslie shared, and I'm very excited to get to as many questions as we possibly can. Uh, just a reminder, you can submit those through the question panel. Uh, with that, I want to welcome all of our panelists back. Let's see if we can all get our webcams up and running here. There we go. There's Eric. And welcome, Rye. And there's Leslie. Wonderful. All right, uh, with that, uh, thank you again for joining. We have a lot of questions, so I'm not even going to take the, the moderator's right to ask my own and just go straight to the audience. So a lot of people are very excited about the idea of innovation and change and that this is a field that, that's changing. Um, so this is a question of what has been missing from the mix in the example of the innovation in agricultural land? So is this about... Um, this says, uh, what would you suggest anything different from the regulatory standpoint to support new innovation um, in working land? Uh, maybe, Rai, since we put you on the spot and made you speak first, do you have any questions or any uh, suggestions for this? And then, Leslie and Eric, I imagine you have ideas here as well. Uh, sure. I think um, you know there, there are always different approaches that can be taken to this, and some of them are in place. Honestly, I think that uh, NRCS provides some great support to operators to take on new management practices and approaches uh, and to effectively de-risk taking on some of those. Um, but uh, again, I think that there are different partnerships and, you know, either uh, with government or even again with other private uh, foundations or other groups, grants that can be uh, achieved or, or received to, uh, to innovate and come up with, with new approaches to uh, operating working lands. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, so I, I guess I'll leave it at that. <laughs> that sounds I'm, like I'm a, good, a, good a good start. Leslie, it. anything to ask? Is oh, there, Leslie, I don't, have to, I don't speak in front of large groups nearly as often as they do. So uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll take that as a, a little bit of an out here. Um, Thank you. Um, so I think uh, Rai spoke to the need to sort of mitigate the risk of innovations, and so finding ways to to help people with that risk, uh, backing it uh, essentially is one creative idea that has come up quite a bit. The other thing is that I think we need flexibility, and we need a better public uh, sort of dialogue and engagement on these things. Um, sometimes land managers want to try things 
uh, particularly if they've got, say, a public lands uh, grazing permit, for example. And there are innovations that we could really be doing um, that affect both public and private lands. Uh, they could be very, very beneficial. But uh, there's a lot of rigidity uh, at times in what landowners and land managers are able to do kind of under the public grazing land system. And often that's really driven by um, a, a fear of litigation uh, is really what it comes down to. And just kind of this, this locked in rigidity in some cases between the environmental side and the, the working land side. And so we really need to have sort of better working relationships there so that we can understand, people can understand what we're trying to accomplish and we need the room to make mistakes and learn together. I mean, that we can't grow and learn in this if, if we can't make those mistakes sometimes. So I think it's just that forgiveness and understanding and relationship that's probably at the source of a lot of it. I would, that's great. Uh, Eric, anything to add? Yeah, I, and I, you said in my bio, I uh, did a business degree at, at DU, which is true, and so I bring somewhat of this business uh, MBA background to this and that I think if you look at, at uh, companies they're constantly talking to their customers uh, at least the good ones are and what do their customers need uh, to continue to buy their product and in conservation the customer is really the landowner but it's also the public as well um, but I think if we are talking about private lands we've got to bring the producers the landowners at to the table and say what would make conservation products work better for you and, and and start then designing products around the feedback that we get. And that, I think that's been one of the elements in my mind that's been missing. Rye and Leslie hit on the risk mitigation piece. I think that's critical. We've got to find ways to, uh, to reduce risk for people taking on innovation. Uh, that's, that's, that's a big, big factor. If, if, you know, we're going to talk about, changing grazing management regimes, uh, yet a, a, a landowner really depends on kind of that historic regime or they think they do and, it, and it's their livelihood telling them that or asking them to change that uh, has a lot of risk uh, to it. And, and the, the more we can reduce that risk uh, to, to try new things, the better I think we can innovate. I think that's so important. And Rai talked a little bit about, um, you know, what failure looks like, right? That failure often means that you've learned something and it can be used somewhere else. And I think that that's, that's so important, that, that room to room to fail. Um, going in a slightly different direction, in our last webinar in which we talked about large landscape conservation, we talked a lot about biodiversity. And this person wants to know, what resources do you all use if you do um, work in, with landowners who are interested in fostering more biodiversity in how they manage their lands. What sort of support is out there? Where, where do you start them off? Maybe Leslie would love to start with you and then um, you know, Eric could rise if you have anything to add. Sure, well there, um, there are um, both state and federal programs out there that are available for landowners. Obviously the Farm Bill programs, uh, Partners for Fish and Wildlife uh, is another great one that landowners really like. There are state level programs working with landowners. And then there's a whole bunch of private resources, Ducks Unlimited, Audubon, uh, you know, a lot of those different groups are, are making resources available to help landowners. And those are very good partnerships for the most case, um, for the most part. The, um, one of the, the hangups we run into is that, um, I think unintentionally, something like the Endangered Species Act, um, can, uh, uh, create some fear and create some disincentive to, to restore biodiversity. We, we support the, the Endangered Species Act, but the way it's implemented, uh, we'd like to see that more reward landowners who step forward and do proactive voluntary conservation. And there are tools out there, uh, regulatory assurance agreements that say, hey, if you improve this habitat for these kind of species, you know, you're not going to get dinged on the regulatory side for having done that. Those are really important tools, but they need to be refined. They're kind of clunky. They're difficult. They, they take years, sometimes a lot of cost. And we're working on a big project right now with a number of partners trying to help improve those tools. So I think if we can really help landowners, you know, again, that's another piece of the risk. Take the risk out of the equation so that you really can get out there and, and help promote biodiversity. I think that's a crucial, a crucial piece. Wonderful. Eric or Rai, anything to add to that? I, I would just add that for us, you know, it's really important to what I call stay in our lane. We have an expertise in a certain 
area of, of conservation, but we've got many great partners. And so it's really the 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 conservation easement, I'll speak to that specifically, is, is we look at as kind of the beginning of the relationship with the landowner when we put that easement in place. We often find landowners who want to do more and our goal is to connect them with resources that allow them to achieve whatever those goals and objectives they're looking for, be it biodiversity, be it water resources, uh, infrastructure improvements, things like that we can we can do. And, and, and that's where I think the collaborative nature of, uh, of conservation uh, is, is, is great. Um, we can always do more, but I, I think also recognizing that you, you have certain expertise and, and advance that and find partners that can help you and the landowners do the other thing. Wonderful. I would just add that uh, good management leads to healthier ecosystems, whether it be soil health, whether it be native grasslands, uh, whether it be watersheds, uh, and that leads to, to greater biodiversity. So it really comes down to the management of the land, uh, working lands uh, and otherwise, just to ensure that, that what your practices are long-term viable. And if you do that, then you're going to improve biodiversity. On top of that, there are programs that lead, if you're, if you're looking at kind of large mammal biodiversity, there are programs in place that encourage ranchers from a financial standpoint and otherwise to ensure that the habitat on their properties and the resources uh, uh, for um, game species, particularly if you look at, at uh, um, programs like Ranching for Wildlife, uh, there are programs in place that can ensure the viability of ranches economically that also contribute to uh, habitat and um, and uh, uh, wildlife corridors and biodiversity uh, on properties. Great. I, I love that idea that um, there's so many resources out there. And so, Eric, I like uh, your mention of, of partnerships and, and Rai, thank you for adding uh, a sort of a related question maybe about partnerships. Uh, this person wants to know, and, and Leslie, you touched a little bit on the impact of recreation. Um, so this person wants to know if uh, private landowners ever work with the recreation industry, um, you know, if that if there's any partnerships that exist uh, or if that's more of a, a, a competition in, in some ways for, for existing lands. Uh, I don't know who to direct that one to. Anyone want to give it a start? Um, I, can, I think I can give it a start. Um, so I, I don't know if uh, if I quite understand the question um, in terms of the competition. Um, yes, landowners uh, are participants in the outdoor recreation uh, world uh, in many ways. We have lots and lots of landowners that run hunting and fishing in various ecotourism programs. We have guest ranches, um, all kinds of different interactions at different levels. Different states have different laws around public access, so that affects what's happening in different states. Um, we have landowners that are doing pretty innovative things with um, with access, and um, there's a wonderful set of landowners in Nevada, for example, that have really built in outdoor recreation and mountain biking trails into their whole, um, you know, diversified management, bottom line, and conservation plan. Um, that's not entirely unusual. So I think there's a lot of, you know, play back and forth between those two things. It's uh, I think that the question that you know comes up for us a lot though is that outdoor recreation doesn't necessarily equal conservation, as I said in my talk. Um, and so the idea that some people have that you should just take the working lands element out of the landscape and replace that with human recreation um, is really problematic. You know, when you're, when you're talking about real conservation, that's a, that's a problematic perspective. So I think really recreation really enhances the bottom line for a lot of our ranches. I mean, uh, it's very important to them. Uh, it just has to be balanced. That makes sense. And I think, Eric, maybe that speaks to some of your uh, comments earlier about valuation and, and other ways of, of thinking about the economic benefit um, to the, the landowner himself, which leads to me to uh, yet another question. So a few people want to know about uh, about any movements to, to change valuation. So, you know, Eric, you talked a little bit about why it's problematic. You know, the, it seems backwards, I imagine, to many people who aren't familiar that we would value land based on what's not happening there. Um, are there movements, uh, you know, who, who gets to decide it? And can you talk a little bit more about, about that issue? Sure, so one of the, and I, and I didn't talk very specifically about the problem of valuation just 
because it's somewhat technical and time consuming, but we're seeing uh, the valuation of conservation easements in the, the traditional mechanism break down where you're, you're seeing uh, today properties have easements on themselves for as much or more than neighboring properties that, that are fairly similar that don't. Uh, and, and when that happens, you can't find value, you're not going to find value in the conservation easement. Um, and so there are, uh, there are movements to adapt the way conservation easements are valued to take more of a conservation minded approach to that. CSU's working on that. Uh, their Ag and Resource Economics Department is working wor working on that. And then the, the area of ecosystem services, uh, of course, is a, is markets is, is where you're seeing a lot of this. And I, I think you're going to see a lot of, uh, I'm, I'm at least very excited about the future. But in Colorado specifically, we were able to uh, in 2019 changed the, the state statute related to our tax credit to allow the state at some point in the future to use alternative methodologies for substantiating tax credits uh, for conservation easements. Uh, and so we're, we're making progress, um, but it's complicated. And what we don't want to do is, is create unintended consequences that would lead to land speculation or other things that uh, that an alternative valuation model um, could lead to. And, and the term alternative valuation drives a lot of people crazy, particularly in the appraisal world. And, but uh, it's, a, it's an easy way to understand what we're trying to accomplish. But um, we, we need it. I think uh, we need to look at different ways to value these things for the future if we're going to even come close to getting the uh, 30 by 30 goals. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, Rye or Leslie, anything else to, to add about valuation? I'm not sure if I'm going to exactly answer the question. I think I would just more um, support what, what Eric is saying generally, but um, I think that we've just uh, got to recognize the public and ecological benefits that these open working lands are providing. Um, you know, a well-managed ranch is already providing a, a whole slew of public and, and ecological benefits, but not capturing the value for that. And increasingly, commodity production alone is not making the bottom line work. And that's the reason that we're losing uh, so many working lands today and, and natural lands to development and other land uses. So we've got to be able to capture uh, some of that value in one way or another. Um, and often the public has an expectation that that would mean an uplift. Um, so you're going to actually can improve habitat, you can do all these improvements. There's kind of an upper limit on that in a lot of lands, and especially well-managed ranches are already producing a lot of those values. So we really need to recognize what those values are providing for the public and see if we can find a way to compensate that now. There's also uplift opportunity in some cases, but making that distinction is, is very important. Um, again, working lands are shrinking, human populations expanding, and we're asking more and more of the working lands that remain to supply all these different values for us. A lot of sense. Um, to that point, uh, we have a question here. How do you think uh, people in urban environments can contribute to the conservation of working lands and rural landscapes? So, uh, you know, is there, uh, is it a philanthropic uh, investment? Are there programs to support? You know, what what is the way, if you think that this is one of the ways that we're going to get to that 30 by 30 or other goals, um, how, how do people support it? Uh, any of you have, have thoughts? Donate to Colorado oh, Cattlemen's yeah. Agricultural Land. <laughs> <laughs> Dang, you beat me to yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, donate to and WLA. Um, yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, gosh, uh, there's lots of ways. Uh, for one thing, uh, letting your uh, congressional representatives know that this is really important to you and that working lands is important is a, is a big piece of it. Uh, contributing to organizations that are actually working with the working lands community, um, not opposed to them, is a big, big starting point. Uh, making sure that those organizations have centered landowners, rural, you know, producers and others in the conversation. Um, a lot of our stuff is still kind of top down and, and it, it doesn't land well in a lot of communities. So um, really effective conservation is going to start with, with talking with the people that are most affected. In, in these communities and on these lands. And so that, that would be a really big 
um, push and of course contribute to those organizations. And I think really open your mind um, to a dialogue. A lot of the story that gets out in the media is polarized. It's always you always read the rancher versus the environmental you know group. Ranchers are against wolves. Or ranchers are against whatever it is. Clean water. And really, that's not the reality. These are very polarized extremes that the media picks up on. There's a big conversation happening in the middle, but the public doesn't have an opportunity often to participate. So just be open-minded and look for those opportunities would be important. And get to know folks, you know, your local rancher, farmer, uh, build relationships is probably the most important thing we can do. I agree I with that. Eric. Maybe add one one additional thing, which is recognize that when you travel across the state, um, that the open spaces oftentimes that you're looking at are because of private landowners. Um, and if you enjoy those views, if you think that's what defines Colorado, um, which I argue it does, I argue that Colorado is defined by its natural beauty um, still to this day, um, then understand that we we we've got to find ways to support uh, the folks that are out there uh, stewarding those lands um, and uh, invest in more conservation uh, and invest in, in, in agriculture as well. And, and recognizing that that plays such a key role uh, in preserving those open spaces and making sure that we have viable wildlife habitat uh, and populations moving forward. And so it's really, in my mind, it's a little bit more fundamental and just recognizing all the resources we enjoy in this in this state are a combination of private and public lands together. And if we don't have that uh, connectivity and that combination, uh, the state will look very different and probably will be less attractive uh, to people in the future. Well said. Ryan, anything uh, else to add from your perspective? No, I think uh, Leslie and Eric did a wonderful job. Um, I think as, as an example of what Eric was pointing out, anybody who lives in Colorado on the Front Range has experienced Greenland Ranch heading south out of Denver towards Colorado Springs uh, and has benefited from the breath of fresh air that it brings when you head south of Larkspur and world opens up for a little bit until you hit County Line Road. And uh, that's the best example that I know of, of privately owned, conserved working lands uh, um, that have prevented a megapolis from running from Colorado Springs to Fort Collins and will in perpetuity. Yeah, I, I think that I think so many people are seeing that connection. I think uh, the three of you should know if, if you didn't join it, I think many people were surprised when um, the chief scientist of WWF talked about the importance of working lands and, and uh, to getting to those goals. And I think the other piece that maybe we'll all learn from is, is that maybe that's not actually so different of a model in other countries. It seems different in the United States, right? So there's sort of the idea that it's either a working land, it's for agriculture, or it's protected and it's for biodiversity and it's separate, you know, that it's not really the same thing or there's no meeting, but, but that's not necessarily the case everywhere else and it certainly doesn't have to be the case here. Um, with that, I can't believe our time is already up. It always goes so fast. I apologize to all the people whose questions we didn't get to, but I want to thank Eric and Rye and Leslie for your time today and for all that you shared and all for all of you for the good work that you're doing uh, on this topic. It's so important and uh, we know that, that working lands are an important part of, of getting to the place we need to get in uh, conservation. So thank you all for joining us uh, and thank you all for your questions. Uh, Eric, Rye, and Leslie, have a good one. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon.